Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining me for day seven of the Light Wellness Experience Workshop. Congratulations, you made it. It has been a nice long week. We've dropped a ton of information on you, hopefully not too much every single day so that we can layer in little bits and make it easier for you to understand, easier for you to digest, and easier for you to start making observations in the lighting in your environments, how it may be impacting your health and well-being and taking values added steps in order to create and maintain a healthier lifestyle under light uh, and support your circadian health and thus your sleep health. And uh, as you know, there's a ton of information out there right now that are you know very disconnected. We have articles about sleep health and how to tend to sleep hygiene. We have articles about blue light at night and you know the risk of using uh, electrical devices. We have articles about natural daylight in the morning and how much you should get, right? But it's all just little drips of information and it can be very difficult to connect those dots. And what we've realized over the last 20 years, roughly, right, is that those dots are very much connected by light and very specific lighting wavelengths. So if you've been joining us, thank you so much. Um, live, it's a wonderful participation. I've also seen a lot of you join us in our recording. So if you're watching as a recording, remember all of these recordings will stay up until uh, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on December 18th in order to make sure that uh, if you're having a busy schedule and you can't make the live sessions, um, or if you're in an advanced time zone, you have an opportunity to watch them at some point in time. But you know that throughout this entire week, we've covered a lot of information, all right? On day one, we went over your light wellness guidelines, some sleep health recommendations, and we went over the circadian app. Um, yesterday, we also touched on the circadian app and the how you can use it and the benefits that you can gain from it. So I hope that you've been able to use the guidelines, use the app, and start to see in real time over the course of this experience workshop how these types of of, uh, wellness goals we've created are starting to transform. We've learned about circadian health in great detail and the pillars of wellness that sit on that foundation of circadian health and circadian rhythms. Right? We've learned about the lighting metrics that are used in order to facilitate circadian responses and impact whether or not you can wake up and stay stimulated and productive and how you can use light to wind down and fall asleep. We've talked about the applications of using those lighting metrics. From what direction and orientation should we be receiving the actual light? Where are we positionally in the world geographically, right? And where are we positioned in our environment? And how are we using those spaces uh, in order to start applying the different models of light wellness, right? We have our uh, clinical model that, remember your bucket, right? Your higher intensity of light for uh, shorter durations of time, and then your passive model, which is more geared towards lower intensities of light over a longer duration of time of exposure, right? We talked about wellness ROI and how to get the most return on investment from that value of investment, right? That return on investment are the financial indicators that usually are precipitated by your value of investment which are non-financial indicators, right? They're your quality of life indicators, productivity, wellness scores, right? Um, you know, the, uh, the interdisciplinary relationships and kind of emotional connection and social connection with individuals, right? Um, and all of those can, in the long term, translate into financial indicators in one way or another. And uh, yesterday, we had a wonderful a conversation with Anna Hernando about how physical and occupational therapists specifically can start to not only take ownership and responsibility in a personal caretaking way, but to then have that experience to better pay it forward and start integrating it into existing practices 
or branching off and developing a new uh, therapy practice in a holistic world. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. And uh, today we're going to be wrapping all of those conversations together with our special guest, Miss Annette Kropbenesh. She has been a chronobiologist for many years now. She is a science communicator. And remember, that's what this workshop is all about, is taking all of these different layers of science and research and stripping it down to make it easier for you to understand, to digest, and to apply to your life. So this is literally what she does for a living. Take advantage of her. Drop a comment, ask some questions, let us know what you're thinking, let us know how you're feeling, let us know if you're confused. This is your opportunity to get answers, right? Um, and uh, yeah, and her uh, particular focus is, ding, 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 the, uh, she is a biological light consultant. So we're going to be talking about sleep chronotypes, how to use them to improve your sleep, to improve your productivity while you're awake, and so much more. So with no further ado, I'm going to bring Annette into the conversation. Here we go. Hi, Annette. How you doing? Hello. I'm fine. How are you? I'm doing so good. I'm so excited that you're joining us for this last annuals or yearly session of the Light Wellness Experience Workshop. I think that you are going to be an incredible contributor to the conversation and uh, kind of closing out the year for us. So I'm very, very happy to have you join us. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. So um, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit? Let us know your history, your background, and what you do, and we'll kind of jump into the nitty gritty of all of these details, pulling the workshop together. Um, well, who am I? I? I started out as a biologist and I was always interested in animals. And during my study, I found out that we're having an internal clock and that this clock is fundamental to our life. And no matter if you look at an animal or a plant or bacteria, or of course on us, because we are just animals, this clock is really, really important and um, really interesting and it fascinated me. And I have worked on animals for quite a while. My topic in my PhD was actually um, when do koalas sleep and what do they do when they don't sleep? which was um, a very sleepy experience, I have to say, but still quite interesting because I covered lots of the uh, timing factors, what we call side givers, and we will talk about them today. Um, and then I work, worked on other animals, but about 10 years ago, I started to work on an environmental topic most of us, at least then, weren't aware of, which is light pollution. The fact that we're changing the quality of night, we're taking away the darkness. And um, as you said, I'm working as a biological light consultant, but I'm also a darkness consultant because we need both at the right time of the day. And this is very, very important. And we have lots of scientific information on this, but it hasn't really been transformed into medicine into lighting design into our daily life and especially when we're talking about health and well-being it can change so much and it's actually so easy and much cheaper than buying all the vitamins and going to the sports studio and it's, it's just a great thing we can do for our life. Yeah, absolutely. And you've even been able to reach, as we were discussing earlier, you recently did a presentation for the United Nations on this topic. I mean, that just shows the breadth and the scope of which we're reaching in order to start making real uh, global impact, right? Def definitely. It is a, a big problem for, for humans, but, but also for all life on Earth. And we haven't taken too much attention to it. We really have to focus on that. It might not be the biggest problem our environment has, but it's actually one we can tackle quite easily and different to things like um, getting away from cars or changing our energy sources. Changing the way we work with light is rather easy because we have the technology, we have lots of knowledge about it, and light is better for the environment, is better for us and would in 
increase life quality. So this is a bit of a win-win situation. And I'm trying, I'm part of a group of people globally who are trying to change our way to see light and put more value into darkness. Yeah. And what's the name of that group? So our viewers can research that. Well, it's it's not a real group. We're just a, like a, a network of people. We're not really organized in that way. There are a couple of groups that really work on this. There's the International Dark Sky Association, for example, who's um, doing lots of um, activities on this. They try to raise awareness. If you look at the research side, there's the Loss of the Night Network, which is a loose network of scientists from all different disciplines working together. And um, th this is the thing, because light pollution is rarely new in our minds. We haven't really organized ourselves. We're meeting all the time in the same meetings, but um, there, there's no real big head organization at the moment. Yeah. All right. Well, that's good to know. And so I'll be dropping the names of those organizations that she mentioned in the comments after the interview in case you're interested in researching. We'll drop their websites as well. Um, so, yeah, so there is. But the one thing that you kind of mentioned that I think we can expand on and jump into, you know, the, the kind of deep dive of the conversation is that this is something that unlike uh, energy sources, right, those are things that we rely on other individuals to provide for us, um, something that we cannot obtain naturally without an you know an organization doing deep drilling or building you know energy stations or plants around them and extracting for us right light is omnipresent in the daytime right i always tell my participants and my clients daylight is free right it's free 99 go out and get you some and flex that light wellness muscle and we need energy in order to be able to power electric lights but if you move into a built environment, right, or you work in a built environment, light is omnipresent. So this is not just something that you rely on other people to give to you. It's something that you can start to, as an individual, take ownership for personally and intimately. You don't have to wait for someone else. All you need is the knowledge and you need access to light and you need to figure out what type of light to get and during the day and when to remove certain types of light, right? Um, so this is something that, like you said, can be capitalized on immediately and we can start putting into effect. And once we get those organizations in place to really start creating a cohesive and unified message, right? I think that's one of the things that's really been missing across the globe because so many people know about this. And we've mentioned earlier in the workshop that as we, and you and I have talked about this, that, you know, as research comes out and more and more is known about circadian health, more is known about sky pollution, more is known about light and its impact on both, right? That we are, we kind of keep that information close to ourselves and in our inner circles because we want to figure out a solution before we send it out to the masses. Um, but that's not really how technology has ever worked. Right. So why are we harboring this information? Why aren't we disseminating it as we are able to discover it and then learn more about how it's being applied iteratively, if you will. Right. Um, and so developing that kind of unified message, while it's critical to see these applications flourish and make the most impact, we, uh, we have to have some sort of a starting point. And so that's kind of what this workshop is. That's what these organizations are working towards. And like you said, we all kind of show up in the same meetings and, and are meeting similar individuals and are like, oh, we can create this cohesive group, right? Which is in essence what LVG was created for. Who knows, maybe one day we'll be able to kind of spearhead those conversations. Um, but at the at the end of the day, we really need to be working together and figuring out how to start getting this out there now because clinical research will only take us so far. We have to start seeing this in real world applications. Um, but 
one of the critical issues of real world applications is getting that feedback and, you know, having individuals say, yeah, this is really working for me. And one of the issues that we find in in personalizing and in developing this and creating these applications is that every person is, you know, individually unique. And we have these factors that are very personal to us. And that's our behavioral lifestyle. Um, it is our work and social lifestyle, right? But it's also our biological factors. And that's something that that's where you started. So can you share a little bit about the difficulties that we're facing in getting these applications out there and how we can kind of amend that or tackle that based on our biology and more specifically our chronotypes and explain what those are and whatnot? Definitely. Um, the, the, the basic thing we have to keep in our mind is that we have evolved as humans as day active. So the idea is that we're active during the day in the sunlight, not necessarily to be outdoors all the time, but to get lots and lots of sunlight and to get rest during the night. And this worked well for thousands of years until we got the incandescent light and um, all that followed up. And this changes our biology because we have this internal clock and this internal clock runs under the control of the hormone melatonin. And there's a lot of talk about melatonin and I'm sure you talked about this it, this week because this is what basically, it's not a sleeping hormone as such, but this is the hormone our body produces at night to tell our body, okay, go to rest mode. And it's even much more complicated. Many people I talk to think that we switch the lights off and then melatonin is produced, but it's not that easy. Melatonin has an internal cycle, which is actually, uh, it's created by our genes. And this cycle is run by our body in the first place. So we have like a pendulum. It's low during daytime and it increases in the evening and it actually decreases during the night, making sure that we're ready for the day in the morning. But this internal rhythm has to be synchronized with the outside and this is done by light. It's done every morning when the sun rises and every evening when the sun sets. And if we have this, if we have this nice synchronization between our body our genes and the sunlight out there, or the sun cycle out there, then our body works well. And we're taking this away. And most people don't understand this, this correlation in the first place. So we need these changes in daylight and we need this wonderful bright light during the day and the darkness at night. But then, as you said, we are individuals. We have these so-called chronotypes. And this means that not everybody wants to get up early in the morning when the sun rises. So some people want to sleep a bit longer. And then there are people who are tired rather early in the evening and other people who can stay away for hours after the sun set. And this too is written in our genes. These chronotypes are genetically determined and it's not something we can change during our lives. It's how we are born. But society has a different idea. We have this, this idea in our society that we have to get up early to be productive. The early worm gets the bird. I think we have this saying in most Western societies, and I know it's also in, in several Asian societies. So we, we value people who are in the office at eight o'clock in the morning or maybe even earlier and are ready for the day. People who get up later but work until midnight, they often get told that they're sloppy or lazy. But they can be as efficient, as creative if they're allowed to work in their rhythm. Because this is how we're built. Mm -hmm. And um, there's research out there showing that if you're forced into another rhythm, you can't work as efficiently as you would. And aside of thousands of people who have been interviewed by researchers, most of us can really feel that themselves. Because 
About 80% of Western people are forced to get up earlier than they're supposed to. And if you want to know if you're one of these, then ask a very simple question. Do I need an alarm clock in the morning? If the answer is yes, then you're getting up too early. And then you can't work as well as you would if you maybe, it might be half an hour, it might be an hour. Actually, for most people, probably the best time to get up is eight o'clock in the morning. Although this also changes with seasons because it's linked to, to sunrise. And, yeah. um, and it's also different a bit geographically. But we, we are forced to get out of this because society doesn't understand this chrono, these chronotypes. And often we are told, oh, you just have to get used to it, go back to bed earlier. But then if you're not an early chronotype, you can go to bed at nine o'clock, but you probably won't uh, fall asleep because no matter what you do, your body hasn't started to produce melatonin. Yeah. And you can't go to sleep. You can't force yourself to sleep. So it's a waste of time. You might even fall asleep later because your body basically rebels against it. And you need, you, you're losing activity time to get tired again. Mm -hmm. And this is an issue we're having. And only few people are aware of this. And most people don't know what good sleep is and how it feels to be well rested because Starting in childhood, we are forced to get up too early. And it's even worse for teenagers, actually, than for adults. And all people who say, I would like to sleep until eight or nine, are told, oh, yeah, you're a late riser. But actually, the majority of people would like to do that. Yeah. And they've just trained themselves, right? They're forcing themselves to wake up. They're forcing themselves to fall asleep at an, at an earlier time. And when you're forcing yourself, usually you're in some way applying some sort of synthetic means to be able to do so. You might be taking a sleeping pill. Some people rely on, you know, other means. And, and we've talked about the impact of, you know, using over-the-counter sleeping pills or alcohol or even narcotics, right? And what you're doing to your body furthermore. Um, and I think it's really interesting because people also think that they aren't getting, like, even if, if, if they have a healthy aligned rhythm and they're waking up when they're supposed to be and falling asleep when they're supposed to be, they still think that they're not healthy because they're getting really, really tired in the middle of the day. Um, and they think that that is an indicator that, oh, I didn't get quality sleep last night, or I did, you know, I ate too heavy of a meal, um, or I'm just really, really stressed out and maybe I'm depressed, right? A lot of people start, and then, and then that creates a kind of a mental cycle, right? They think they're depressed and they're going to fall asleep in the middle of the day. And, and then they get upset and they don't want to wake up the next day and it just becomes this vicious cycle. But one of the things that we really drive home is how normal and natural that post-lunch dip, that sleepiness in the middle of the day is because that's actually a biological function of melatonin in its rhythm. Um, and so, you know, I'd love for you to talk about that a little bit and kind of key, maybe elaborate more on the sleep epidemic that we're seeing for uh, for middle schoolers and teenagers and, uh, and how that might be mitigated or how we can start to correct that. Um, because like you said, it's a problem and they need, you know, we, we have this politically correct world where we say we have a recommended number of sleep hours. And we do that because we don't want to force anyone, you know, we don't want to force anyone's hand. We understand that our social uh, kind of constructs and our culture is designed to, to function in a certain way, right? You don't want to be the person that kind of raises your voice, but they're not just recommendations when it comes to health and biology it's really a requirement if you want to be, you know, as effective and productive in your life and maintain proper mental and emotional health. Um, and children, unfortunately, like you said, they're getting the worst of it, right? Because now we have so much more technology and there are so many more demands placed on them and we're kind of forcing them to grow up, you know, 
sooner than than their bodies really are are, are supposed to um, from a biological standpoint, right? We're putting all of these kind of mental and social um, stressors on them. And, uh, and I'd like to talk a little bit about that because especially during the pandemic, once we, you know, we were already restricting and limiting our access to natural daylight just through kind of the social constructs of the world nowadays. But then when the pandemic happened, everyone got scared and they didn't want to go outside or it became so easy to just sleep in and not open the blinds, right? And get that extra one to two hours of sleep. And then, and then you know, depression, which is very much linked to circadian disruption, starts to seep in. And again, that's that vicious cycle where it gets harder and harder to get out of bed and get natural light. And we've seen a spike in mental health disorders um, being diagnosed, particularly in younger age groups. So, you know, would you would you comment on that a bit and kind of pull that conversation together for us? Yes. Um, also, actually, we, we've been seeing different things going in different directions. Yeah. One thing you mentioned, and this was pretty much depending also on the country and the measurements against uh, the, the or in terms of the pandemic, they were different. Um, here in Germany, for example, we were allowed to go outside. Well, not in the first, I think, one or two months. They, they, they said go outside, but please don't sit on the grass. Um, but then they realized that it's not that dangerous to go outside and it's much more dangerous to stay indoors. And if you want to meet, do this, especially in summer. I think this helped a lot because, as you said, we need the sunlight and there are very clear um, relations between the amount of sunlight we're getting and depression. And if we look into the treatment of depression, something really interesting is going on there. For a long time, we use light therapy. And light therapy works as well, maybe even better than taking antidepressants with much less side effects because we're getting the light at the right time of day. And this is also something that has been discussed in nursery homes and hospitals. Lighting there is usually horrible. It's too dark during the day and it never gets dark at night. What has been shown in several studies from several sites is that the time you spend in a hospital and your chances of survival are higher if you're getting lots and lots of daylight if you're close to the window and if your window faces the south side. So this is a bit of a life hack. If you have any any way to choose your hospital bed, try to get to, to the sunlight as much as possible yeah. and, or sit at the window, get this sunlight because it's much better than anything you can get in there. Yeah. And the same is true for nursery homes. They, they need more light, especially elderly people. Their melatonin production isn't as good anymore as it is in, in younger people. So they need more light during the day. But they're spending the whole day in, indoors, which has many, many problems. But light is one big issue here. So they need to sit at the window and much better get out because they need the fresh air and, and all these things. And we yeah. have to take this into account if we are designing such places. As is true for all workspaces and school, lighting in workspaces and especially in schools, is, oh, it's horrible. They, they just use some cheap light mm -hmm. and this has to change. I think it's changing a lot in offices because we more and more understand the circadian rhythms. We understand that we need bright light to be able to concentrate. And it's also an economical thing. There is the idea that if my if I use bright light, my people will work more and are more efficient, which is true to a certain degree. We have to find the right balance in it. We we need times of dimmer, warmer light, and then we need times with bright lights. Let's be honest, on a really bright sunny day, we usually sooner or later go to the shade because we want we, we, we want we don't want Reprieve. this. Problem time yeah so we have the same in the offices but in schools it's still a disaster it's so ugh, gloomy in there and the students really have problems staying awake there and there's another thing we're seeing in teenagers and there also has been lots of research about it it's about their chronotype 
Our genes determine whether we are an early or late chronotype. And actually, there are some other chronotypes, like people who are active during the day and during the afternoon, but have like a, a dip around noon. And there are the people who really, really should have their siesta or power nap or however you call it. And this is actually a really good thing because, indeed, our melatonin levels, they rise around noon. If we're well synchronized, this is absolutely normal. Mm -hmm. So if you're just a bit tired or you want to have some rest around noon, that's exactly what your body is built to do. That's fine. Especially if you're getting a good amount of sleep at night. So let's do this. Enjoy this. Yeah. It's, it's Lean great. into that nap. Lean into the dip, right? Yeah. I'm I'm a, an excited napper. I love my my afternoon nap, and I'm not a power napper. I I need a bit more time, um, but I enjoy that. I really enjoy that. And after this, I'm much more productive, and I feel much better. So yeah. do this definitely. Yeah. And then after your nap, go out and get some daylight if you can, right? Exactly. Suppress any remnant melatonin in your system and, you know, so get, give your body that biomarker to say, hey, it's time for those day active genes to kick back into high gear, right? Definitely. Or even you can even have this, this midday nap in the sun. Yes. This works. I encourage that all the time. Actually, in the light wellness guidelines, I think I sent you the package. I said, I highly encourage, you know, bright midday snoozes, sleep in the sun. It's awesome. And I know being a girl raised in the South and Florida, close to beaches, I mean, we would go out and we would tan, which I know isn't always the best, but I would always fall asleep laying in the sun. You know, you had to make sure you had lots of sun, <laughs> sunscreen on so that you didn't burn. But yeah, bright midday snoozes, lean into yeah. it. So, but we were talking about teenagers. Now, what happens with teenagers? We're born with a certain chronotype, but as all parents know, small children are early risers. It drives most of us completely crazy. And then they start to wake up later and later and later when they get into adolescence, when they start to be teenagers. And what usually happens is that society says, oh, they're lazy. They should go to bed earlier. But what really happens is that their physiology changes. Um, no matter when the sun sets, their melatonin is produced later in the evening. Usually, if you would, most studies say after 10 o'clock, again, depending on where you are. So even if you send them to bed at nine, the body isn't prepared to fall asleep. They just can't fall asleep. They will lie awake. And this is what many teenagers say. And then uh, we blame electronic devices for this, which is true to a certain amount. Why? Electronic devices have lots and lots of blue light. And our circadian system is particularly sensitive to blue light. It also reacts on all other light. You can mess up your circadian rhythm with a nice warm incandescent light. We have to keep that in mind. But blue light is more powerful here. So you have this teenager who isn't tired anyway because his body clock says it's still time to be active and out and about. What do they do? They sit in front of the computer or they check emails or they watch a movie or maybe they're even learning. Um, I mean, some of them are really, they, they want to, to use the time. They're not yeah. all lazy. Um, and then their body clock is even more delayed. So it's even harder for them to go to bed. But even if they would not use the electronic light or if they would uh, avoid blue light, they would get tired later at, at night. But they need this time in the morning for sleep. Now they have to get up at six, at five. I know teenagers who have to get up at four o'clock in the morning to be at school and time. Yeah. For them, even eight o'clock is still within their body sleep time, within their natural physiological sleeping time. And studies have shown they're sitting in the classrooms, eye wide, eyes wide open, trying to concentrate, but their brain is asleep. Yeah. And they can't force that. Yeah. But our society, again, ignores this. Many teacher, uh, teachers don't know. And it's a real problem because this, uh, these teenagers, they are sleep deprived. And we know that sleep deprivation is very bad for the way 
we digest our food for the choice of food because if we're sleep deprived we prefer sugary fatty things and let's be honest teenagers like them anyway and if you're stressed you're even more prone to eat them so we're putting another factor on bad nutrition mm -hmm. but also they they might not be fit enough to have exercise they it's easier for them to go into depression and some schools have picked up on this and they have delayed their starting times. And what they found is the students, they, are, they behave better, they work harder, their marks uh, um, in, improve, they are sick less often, they have less disciplinary problems and their drug use is reduced. Because you mentioned sleeping pills earlier, but if you take sleeping pills and are sleep deprived, you need something to wake up in the morning. So they start with caffeine, but they might use cigarettes, energy drinks, and sooner or later try something harder. Yeah. And this this is a big issue. So what's happening at the moment is that we we are forcing teenagers to give up on healthy sleep. We are blaming them for not being able to sleep at the time they they have to sleep, or we're forcing them to sleep at the time when their body still isn't willing to go to sleep which compromises their emotional health and thus their mental yeah. health. And it kind of becomes a gateway. Exactly. And instead of using this time in the evening to do something um, useful and honestly, reading a book or talking to friends is a useful thing. We're forcing them to lie in the bed, staring on the ceiling, feeling guilty that they can't go to sleep. So what they have to go through is really harsh. And now comes a pandemic where the schools were closed over longer times. And what we actually saw were these teenagers slept longer. And for many teenagers, this took away pressure and their mental health actually improved. Okay. And this is something we should learn from it. Some things happening in this pandemic are bad and bad for our mental health. Others are good, which might have balanced things out a bit. Otherwise, we probably would all be completely crazy by now. But what we should have learned by this is we need this sleep in the morning. And many adults need it too. Many people in home office, they use this extra hour. They usually were commuting. Um, they use them for, for sleeping, not because they're lazy, but because it's healthy for their body. Yeah. So what we should do in our society is we should really look at these chronotypes, how they change in life, and adjust our working schedules to our biology, not the other way around. This would be healthier for us. And if you're thinking in terms of money, we would save heaps of money with this because people would be more productive, they would be healthier, the whole society would run better we just have to overcome this idea that we have to get up at six o'clock in the morning. Yeah. In order to be more productive because productivity, people think you need to pack more hours in a day of work to have more productivity when really if our body was able to function at its fullest capacity, right, we would be more productive. You're going to get more work out of a well-rested, mentally healthy uh, individual in three hours than a, a poorly rested or as we say, a poor sleep health employee um, who, you know, over the course of uh, an eight hour day or now maybe a 10 hour day, right? Um, it's, it's really unfortunate. You know, I, I, I am a very big advocate of the four day work week. Um, and not just the four day work week in terms of let's get 40 hours in four days and give them that third day off so they can sleep. No, reduce that additional eight hours, right? It's a 32 hour work week or 30 hour work week. And you're going to get more productivity out of that and probably see more gains. And you're also probably going to be wasting less money on employee expenses because instead of someone taking that extra day off and getting paid for not working that PTO, right? That money is still actually going into their, to their salary and you're going to, they're going to be productive during that time. And the time that's allocated for them to be off, you're not essentially paying them for that time. Right. So um, it's, it's interesting how small business owners and especially large corporations, right? Because a small business owner might have 10 employees or something 
Um, I think I think kind of the if you're looking at Forbes or or Entrepreneur Magazine, they they in, indicate that I think a small business. Uh, is 50 employees or less and like a medium sized business is like 50 to 100. I'm like, that sounds like a large business to me. Right. Um, but, you know, if you are have 10 employees and you look, if you think all of those employees are being impacted, which they might not all be, but let's just say for the sake of numbers, right, all 10 employees have poor sleep health. And so you're spending on average, you know, research, evidence based research has indicated over the course of the last seven to you know 12 years that we're spending annually on average roughly 4500 to 6500 dollars um in you know kind of health expenses if you will paid time off and whatnot on poor sleep health employees versus around 500 dollars for a high sleep health employee. So if you multiply that, say $5,000 times 10 people, right? That's $50,000 that went down the drain. You multiply that by 100, that's, you know, 100 employees, that's $500,000, right? So that's a lot of wasted expense that could be used as, you know, capital or capital or expenses inside your company, right? It can be overhead expenses for other things and and growth and marketing, which then then could produce more productivity, right? Because you're potentially bringing in more clients. And so we are scared to look at investing in maybe a $100,000 lighting system, right? If you have 100 employees and, you know, you might be wasting $300,000 a year on PTO, but we're scared to invest that 50 to 100 grand into a lighting system or to another sleep intervention inside a company that could offset that balance, right? And you're actually going to be saving and, and that savings, those savings happen annually. So it's not just like, oh, I'm, I'm going to be saving this much one, you know, it's a one off. No, every single year, you're going to be saving that much money by this one time investment, right? And so it's, it's a very compelling conversation when you're actually able to talk about those financial indicators and the return on investment. But because of the individuality of all of the occupants, right, because of an, a company with 500 employees or 100 employees, right, their lighting designers and architects are kind of scared to have that conversation because they feel so much responsibility and so much weight to personalize every aspect of the, of the design for every personalized aspect of each unique individual and uh and there's a there's a better way there's actually an easier way to start looking at how to program spaces in order to make the most value for your light wellness investment it can be a nested environment it can be programming certain spaces in that don't already exist or reallocating spaces for bright light therapy or dark light therapy, or transitioning and overhauling your office for how it's programmed right now, where I know one of the things we've discussed in kind of the history of developing the corporate interior is how we used to have our higher paid employees um, who have more ex uh, uh, you know, expendable income in order to create healthier lifestyles for themselves. They get the corner offices with all of the windows. And so they're getting healthier. They've got a lot of money and they can invest it into their life. And then we have our minion workers that are packed into the core of the building who aren't getting productivity and are losing money um, and may even lose their job because they're losing productivity. And so that thus you know, pushes them into kind of a lower um, income bracket if you will. And that just makes their quality of life that much harder to attain from a health standpoint, right? So kind of restructuring where we position workers based on, you know, sun, sun access, right? The sun rises in the east and sets on the west, right? Maybe, maybe we divide our spaces now where if you are a business that runs full time, maybe the majority of your, you know, day shift workers are um, located on the eastern side of a building and the majority of your night shift workers, it's not always possible, right? But there's different ways to start are, are on the west side of the building, right? But there's ways that we can start it's not going to work in a hospital setting, but it might work in a manufacturing plant. Right. Um, and when you're looking at where a storage facility is for a manufacturing plant versus where administrative or human resources are placed. Right. Like how are we actually programming these spaces for their use and how are you writing in as a business owner? 
or a teacher um, or some sort of district representative, right, uh, or even a municipality, how are we looking at how we can structure in schedules based on individuals' chronotypes? Are we able to create flexible scheduling where they can clock in when it fits their when it fits their sleep health? Right. And then they can clock out as well um, and really give them that autonomy in a sense to be able to choose their schedule. And uh, and I think it, it can be difficult because sometimes certain organizations might need to keep administrative resources intact 24-7 um, in order to maintain you know, the productivity and maintain uh, work, you know, on-site operations, if you will. Um, but, you know, especially now we're seeing this transition during the pandemic that businesses can continue to run and thrive and grow with remote workers. So we're seeing people off-site, right? And I know you've probably seen on LinkedIn, all of the polls, all right, what would you prefer? We've, we're 18 months, two years into this pandemic. What would you prefer? 100% on-site, 50% on-site and 50% remote or 100% remote? What's your preference, right? And I think that now that we're actually able to see this in effect, that people are really looking at and reevaluating what's possible. And that's the first step to opening up this conversation of how we can actually start reprogramming and structuring our spaces and how they're used to get the most benefit out of natural daylight and in which spaces we need to create big gestures for electric lighting strategies rather than feeling the weight of providing it all over a space and really eating into a client's potential renovation budget, right? Yes, well, the different aspects you, you've mentioned now, like th there are actually companies, especially um, I know this from startup companies mm -hmm. who g got away from these fixed working hours mm -hmm. and they're, they're saving office space, office space because there are people who are only coming in later in the day and some people come in in the morning. And I remember my time at university, there was a real night shift. There were a couple of, of students and researchers who would always be there or only be there at night and they probably had all night uh, projects, but they chose it that way. Yeah. So we have some um, flexibility there or the possibility and m many companies do shift work and shift work for your circadian system is a disaster. And strictly speaking, we should avoid it wherever we can. And there are some areas like in hospitals or police transport, we need it. But we should really, really assess if we should be willing to afford this at, in times in, in jobs where, where it's not really necessary, like in, in the producing industry. Yeah. And this is something we really have to, to think about and we really have to assess. Now, um, if we have to use shift shifts or working shifts, then we should check people's chronotype. And yes. usually we have three shifts during the day. So um, instead of just forcing everyone to work every three shifts, maybe we should ask people, would you prefer the early shift, the night shift, the day shift, and see if we can basically take into account what chronotype people are because some people will be fine working at midnight mm -hmm. but they will be wasted if they have to work at six o'clock in the morning and other others will be happy to work at six o'clock in the morning so why don't we take this into account um this is some rethinking we we should we really should do and i think that workspace and the atmosphere and work would really improve by this it would be interesting to see in the future if recruiters or rec employment recruiter agencies kind of add that question inside their initial questionnaire. All right, what, you know, give them a sleep chronotype quiz and say, what sleep chronotype are you? And then start allocating positions that are for kind of evening or late night shift work for individuals that have a late night chronotype, right? And that might be kind of a starting point where we can start to really restructure that social construct. It's a very, a very simple, very simple step, very simple start. Okay, you're using a recruiter. 
Let's see what sleep chronotype you are and let's pull jobs that are going to match that for you rather than force you into jobs that may not. Right. Um, it would be you know, kind of interesting to see if that's something that could happen. Um, we're coming up on a 50 minute mark, so we'll get some closing statements. I know one of the things that I wanted to mention that we didn't get a chance to mention yesterday when we were talking about skilled nursing facilities and assisted nursing facilities is that one of the reports that I had read was. Uh, on average, a patient only gets about 18 minutes of natural daylight per day. Um, and usually that's from an indoor setting somewhere deeper, you know, into the environment, not right immediately next to a window. You know, we've all seen those dreary pictures of individuals sitting in chairs or in wheelchairs in a room that has a lot of windows, but they might not be facing the window or they're all facing each other to encourage, you know, communication and togetherness. So, um, so that's, that's something that really, you know, kind of when I was first studying this really impacted my thought process on programming spaces and just programming how we, you know, thinking about how we move throughout life. I know one of the one of the tips or suggestions that our holistic occupational therapist had said yesterday was to create a circulation path that requires patients to move you know, in a, a certain orientation with the sun to get from point A to point B. So instead of just taking them, you know, any direction to get from their room to the cafeteria, they have to do kind of the wrap around and walk through this specific path in order to get there. And again, that's just a, a change in a circulation protocol. Right. But people need to understand these nuances and these details to start really implementing these types of applications, even if it's just a movement therapy application. Right. That gives them more access to natural light. Um, so, yeah, there's there's so much that can be done. There are so many conversations that need to be had. And I think that one of the more difficult conversations to have, but the most necessary conversation to have, because this is at the top of everybody's mind because it's required in life is money the financial indicator. And if you can't have that conversation or you're not able to, um, it's going to make extending uh, these, these light and health conversations, these, you know, chronotype conversations, these sleep health intervention uh, conversations, much more difficult to push forward. And it's going to take a lot longer for us to see these types of practical applications realized. So if anyone takes anything away from this workshop, there's so much you should take away from this workshop. But one of the things that you really should take away from this workshop as an individual who's advocating for yourself, for the people who depend on you inside your office or your workspace or inside, you know, a hospital with a doctor, um, we encourage you to have these conversations, but you need to understand the the return on investment right from a health standpoint and from a financial standpoint which many times from a health standpoint it burgeons and uh, and leads into you know financial savings and financial indicators so so take away from this conversation that there's a lot that needs to be done in order to make sure that we as a society are meeting the needs of our sleep health remember in the advent of electric lighting, we didn't know what we were taking away from our bodies, right? And we didn't know that because we didn't understand our bodies this intrinsically and this intimately. We didn't understand the connections and the rhythms and the patterns. We know so much more about it now. And we want you to understand that as well, that it's, it is really hard to juggle all of these many, you know, aspects and details of maintaining the pillars of health and the pillars of wellness, your nutrition health, right? Your hormonal health, your sleep health, your stress health, your emotional and mental health, right? Your physical recovery, your immune system responses, your cardiac and respiratory responses, right? They're all connected. And we understand so much more about that now. And we didn't know that when we created electric light that we were going to be impeding all of those pillars of wellness and our ability to be able to maintain them in a healthy, functional way. But we know that now. So it's time to get it back. And the best way for us to be able to invest in or to see a brighter and healthier future for 
us as individuals and for everyone is to be able to start taking that responsibility in a personal and intimate way because daylight is free 99, right? Go out and get you some and, uh, and understand you don't have to rely on someone else immediately right now. And if you're seeing an issue with or if you're seeing that you don't have the type of environment that lends itself to supporting your circadian health that rather is impeding it right or you don't have a lifestyle where you're actually capable of attaining you know a healthy aligned circadian rhythm what values added steps can you take in order to be able to transition that and change that circumstance for yourself. And when you're able to understand how to do that for yourself, it makes it that much easier for you to pay this message forward and start impacting the lives of others. Um, so, you know, do you have any final thoughts now that we're kind of closing down the conversation, Annette? What I, what I hope that everyone takes away from today is to, to just follow up on what you said is we, we really have this, this internal clock, this body clock, which is fundamental to our life. And we need that. And we need this change of bright days and dark nights. This is part of us. And when I talk about, to people about healthy lifestyle, they tell me about exercise, about food. Um, but they don't talk about light. They don't talk about sleep. This is something... We don't value because maybe because light is cheap it's really really hard to sell daylight as an architect because it's there i mean imagine that there are offices without windows this shouldn't be every office must have a window everything else shouldn't be acceptable the access to sunlight and the access to to natural darkness should be a human right. And stylized. Yes, we, 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 haven't, we haven't reached that point, but it should be something we should all fight for. And we should go and say, I have a right to this because this, this is part of a healthy lifestyle and we need this. And as you've said a couple of times now, it increases the productivity. So even if you're just looking at numbers and money, this is really something to consider. And there's so many companies who have like a pizza night or some gaming facilities in, in their company. It's great, but do something for for the light in your company and daylight is the best you can do. Mm -hmm. And if you can't have daylight and at a certain time, you just have to use electric light because they're gloomy days or in winter, the sun sets too early then use good light and when you mention individuality give people the opportunity to choose their light their light levels a desk light for every person in an office should just be normal so they can decide how much light they want to have and this is so important and it should just be an essential thing in our life to think about light and just after this workshop look at your world with different eyes see the light feel the light and understand what this light is doing to you because it's immensely important for health and the great thing is sunlight is cheap just go out for you don't have to be out for hours but a couple of minutes can do a lot of good and a lunch break with some sunlight, even if it's a cloudy day, yeah. it's, it's a great thing to, to wake up, to feel better, to find it easier to work and yeah. you will be more efficient afterwards. Absolutely. And uh, Annette just touched on a, an important point that, you know, we've reiterated throughout the workshop that even if you can't find the time to go out for one extended consecutive session, you can stack those light exposures and stack those doses, if you will. Right. Go out, get a little bit in the morning, get and take a light break, you know, for five to 10 minutes in the late morning. Take another break in the afternoon and kind of keep gaining access to natural, healthy light. And I know we say get good light, get healthy light. What does that mean? 
watch all of the videos from the workshop. And if you if you missed the videos from the workshop, join us again in eight to 10 weeks when we're going to be bringing this information to you all over again, because as you know, re reiteration uh, is, you know, is the mother of uh, learning and education, if you will. So, um, you know, that's especially information that can be as complex as this. Remember, we're not just talking about one thing. We're talking about a lot of different topics and how they come together and how they're all hinged underneath this very critical critical component that is natural white daylight in a very specific spectrum of that natural white daylight. So if you are confused at the end of this, or even if you understand it, but you still don't quite know how to apply it or how to go out and get it, or if you just want a little bit more support and you know in developing these practices for yourself, reach out. I would love to help you. Annette would love to help you. Um, this is what we do. And we do this because we want to see you be able to reach the, your, you know, your physical, mental, and emotional peaks so that you can become the strongest, healthiest version of yourself that you were always meant to be. Right. And that's what we were. That's why, you know, that's, what life was created, right? That's why we have this evolution under natural daylight. We weren't meant to be inside 24-7. Um, and sometimes we need to be for health reasons, right? For weather reasons. Is it rainy? Is it free? Is it below freezing? Um, and, you know, again, having a built environment is great, but we've created this occlusion to the natural, one of the most critical natural elements that helps to balance all of these other, you know, pillars of health that we keep juggling and we keep blaming old age. We have the adage of old age. Well, I know I'm getting older, so I know that these aspects of, you know, my body and my health are starting to fail me. So I just have to, you know, exercise more. I have to eat better. I might have to take a pill here and there. And then by the time you're in your 70s or your 80s, you might be taking a dozen pills, right? And pharmaceuticals, as we know, all have side effects. Um, and so, you know, really stop and think, okay, before I start blaming old age, why is old age occurring? Why are all of these aspects of my health and well-being starting to crumble so it's harder for me to manage? I have to start thinking about all of these other health considerations in order to maintain proper health and well-being. Let's start with the foundation inside the fundamentals of wellness, right? Our fundamentals are the foundation of circadian health, the pillars that rest on it, and let's prevent all of the cracks in that foundation from tearing our whole building blocks down. Right. Um, so, yeah, thank you, Annette, so much for all of this help and uh, reach out to either of us anytime. I'm going to be dropping Annette's contact information in the follow up post for today. Um, and yeah, we just want to see you become the biggest, best, brightest, strongest versions of yourselves and thus be able to pay it forward to the world so that we can have a stronger world in general, right? A healthier world. Um, that's the end goal. And it's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of commitment and it's going to take a lot of education. So keep coming back because we're going to be giving you this information every eight to 10 weeks. So you don't forget it so that you always feel that you have someone supporting your education and supporting this aspect of transitioning your healthy life lifestyle. All right. So uh, thank you so much. And uh, I'll see you in about three months. Happy holidays. And always remember to live lighthearted. Take care. I'll see you soon. Bye. Again.